Welcome to worship at College Mennonite Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Welcome to those of you gathered here in person on the campus of Goshen College, and welcome to you who are joining us electronically. We're glad you're here. Today is the third Sunday of Lent, and our worship focus during Lent this year is Christ Among Us on the Path of Our Lives. Today, Christ Among Us on the Path of Justice. Please turn to your bulletin or on the screens and read with me the call to worship this morning. Teach us your pathways, O God, and lead us in your truth. Christ among us on the path of repentance. In the midst of this congregation, we praise you. Christ among us on the path of faith. Some take pride in chariots and horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. Christ among us on the path of justice. We give you thanks, for you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. Christ among us on the path of mercy. Lead us in the path of your instructions, O God. Christ among us on the path of We come to worship you, the one who walks with us, behind us, and before us. Christ among us on the path. Our first hymn this morning is Could It Be That God Is Singing? It's number 42 in the Purple Voices Together book. The last line of this hymn always <clears throat> lifts my spirit to a higher place. So watch for references to God breathing music as we breathe in song together. Number 42. And if you wish, please stand. you remain standing and let's pull out the insert in your bulletin Kyrie and Neso Yeah. 
Please join with me in prayer. Gracious God, who deeply feels our joys and pains as if they were your own, in you our delights find meaning. In our brokenness, you make us whole. We pray for our congregation that we may become witnesses to your reign of peace and reconciliation. We pray for those who need your care as their bodies are weakened by illness or injury. We lift up Florence Nussbaum as she's been experiencing some decline. For those whose hearts are grieving, enfold each one with your comfort. We especially lift to you Ruth Sender's family as they celebrated her life yesterday. And we also remember Mary Oyer's family as they prepare to celebrate her life this coming weekend. We pray for all people of faith that we may hold on to the revelation we have been given and share it unashamedly, but also with humility. Gracious God, we pray for the world that you love, this world that Jesus longs to embrace, for warring nations or people groups in conflict. We pray for peace. For those who are impoverished, we pray for the gift of enough. For those who have much abundance, we pray for the gift of generosity. For those in positions of leadership, we pray for wisdom and attentiveness to justice. Gracious God, you are the one who deeply feels our joys and pains as if they were your own. And all these fragments we offer to you, the one who gathers us together and makes us whole. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to turn to number 282 in the Purple Voices Together. As we sing, come and see, you can keep your books open. Um, children and families, you're invited to come to the circle as Jonah leads us today, and we'll sing, come and see, following children's time as well. Good morning, everyone. So today we're gonna to be thinking about some situations and some people. So I'm gonna be asking a lot of questions and you're gonna be thinking of different 
times that you've experienced that or different people that it makes you think of. So we're gonna start with the not so fun part. So think of some times where you were not your best self, okay? So that means maybe a time you were mean to someone or called someone a name or didn't share something, some time that you weren't the person that you usually want to be. I'm not gonna make you share and raise your hand, okay? I will share my own, okay? That way you, you don't have to say it's okay. So one time when I was younger, my sister Sarah was taking too long on the slide and I wanted her to move faster than she was. And so I pushed her and she cut open her chin and she still has a scar right here from where she got cut. And she still reminds me of that a lot. That was not my best self. I usually don't push people, right? That was not a time where I was being very good. Another one is more recent. You notice that I have a different kind of shoe on right now. I hurt my foot while I was running, so I can't run and have to wear this different kind of shoe. I was really, really grumpy when I came home from the doctor's office and they told me that I had to wear this for six weeks, and I was kind of grumpy. And again, to my sister, I was kind of mean. Sometimes she's the one who experiences a lot of me not being my best self. So, that's not very fun, but there are times where we are not the person that we want to be, right? Okay, so now we're gonna flip to the other side, and I want you to think about some times where you have been the best person that you can be. So these can be different ways, right? Maybe you won a big tournament, you won a race or a soccer game, or you went out of your way to be really kind to someone. You saw someone was having a bad day, and you went and gave them a hug, or said something nice to them, or shared a toy with them. Maybe you played with someone at recess who didn't seem to have anybody else to play with. There are a lot of different things that we can do to be nice to someone. Maybe you took care of a sibling. You two are being really nice to each other right now, right? When did you care for someone? So think about a time, again, I won't make you share, but think about a time where you've done something really, really nice for someone, because I know all of you have done something like that. So now we're gonna think about people, okay? So I'm gonna ask you questions, and this time I would like you to share if you have someone that comes to mind, okay? Who is the smartest person that you know? Andrew. God, God? okay. That's a good one, you got to the end. Who else, anybody, what do you think? You, there we go. All right, who's the kindest person you know? Hannah? Love, Love. uh-huh, yeah. Sadie, who's that? One of your classmates, absolutely. Okay, who's the fastest person you know? Probably not me. You again, you're the fastest person you know. Yeah? Your cousin, okay. Okay. What about um, the strongest person you know? Your dad, okay. It's not you, it's your dad. Yeah, Violet? Your dad, okay. So we have a lot of different people in our lives that are the best at something, right? I know people that I think are the best or the strongest at something. People are amazing, right? Think about all of the different things that people have invented, right? We have vaccines so that we don't get sick, but if we do get sick, there's medicine and there's hospitals and there's doctors that can take care of us. Um, look above you. How do you think those big, big beams got put into place? How did the lights get up there? The fans, the wiring, someone figured out how to do that. And it would not be me, I don't like heights that much. Someone did that, right? So who was smart enough to figure out how that can work? How we can put those beams together and attach them in the corners and make them go all the way to the center and hold up our roof? How does that work? I don't know. That's not what I studied in college, so I don't have the answer. But there are people in our church who probably do know, right? There are people in our church who know a lot about cars, 
I don't know anything about cars. There's people who know a lot about cars. We have doctors and professors and teachers and all different kinds of people who are so, so smart. We have people who are really good at their sports. They're really good at their job. We have really amazing people in our church. So the passage for today, one of the verses that I really like, it's a little bit confusing, so I'm gonna read it once and then we'll talk about it, okay? For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. That seems a little backwards. I had to read it a couple times to make sure that I, I felt like it made sense to me. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. I looked up the definition of wise, just, just for fun, and it said having or showing experience, knowledge, or good judgment. So even if there was ever a time where God did not show the best knowledge or judgment, God is still better than when we are at our very, very best. Hmm. So even when we are being the very best person that we can be, God is still better even if God is not at God's best. And when we are our very, very, very strongest, God is still stronger than this even if God is at God's weakest. Wow. To me, that's really comforting because even if I feel like I have a lot of things going on and I know what I'm doing, I still really need help, right? And to know that God always will be bigger than me makes me feel really good. So, and the times that we started off thinking about where we weren't our best and not our best selves, even though God is so much bigger and better than us, God still loves us even when we are not our best. And when we are our best, I bet God's pretty proud. So, let's pray. God, thank you for loving us at our best and at our worst. Thank you for being a God who cares for us, and thank you for the complex world that you have created for us. As we people work to understand how the world around us works, we understand just how great you are. Be with us as we go about our week and as we interact with the people around us. In your name we pray, amen. You can go back to your grown-ups. Our scripture text this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 
For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided, through the foolishness of our proclamation, to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to Greeks. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Our preacher this morning is Phil Waite, our pastoral team leader. Please join me in prayer for Phil. Loving and mysterious God, thank you for Phil's ministry among us and for the message he will bring to us today. May the time that he spent meditating on Jesus bear fruit as we receive his words. Amen. Power takes uh, many different forms. I've been thinking about power this week uh, because this is a sermon about power. So I've been thinking about all the different ways that, that uh, power uh, happens uh, among us and around us. We have uh, all experienced power this morning. Right? So one of the ways we've experienced power is electricity. Power makes things happen. Things happen when, when, when there's power. Power is an ability, the capacity to, to do things, right? To, to make an impact or an influence on the world. A, a crying baby is powerful, has a great deal of power. My dogs, when they, when they sit by the water dish that's empty and they look cute, are exercising a certain kind of power. Uh, an effect, an, a, the power of affection. So, so we have the power of ability, the, the, the ability to do things, and we have the power of affection. And maybe the one, when we think about power, the one we think of the, the most is coercive power. Now, uh, we experience coercive power all the time, don't we? Uh, we all experience coercive power uh, getting, getting here, no matter how we got here. Well, maybe there might, there might be a few people who, didn't, who weren't subject to this kind of uh, coercive power, but um, a locked door is coercive power, right? It says, I have the power to lock this door and to keep out people who shouldn't be here. That's a, a kind of imposition of will, uh, uh, of coercion, of control over other people. Uh, when the the uh, light turns red and I stop, I am subject to coercive power. This light stops. Now I could go, I could ignore it and go, but there's there's a price to pay. The government is telling me, you stop here, or this is gonna happen, or maybe you're gonna get in a a bad accident. Uh, Our our, uh, criminal codes are, are filled with this kind of coercive power, this power of will, this power to enforce uh, a standard of behavior, to say, you're gonna behave this way or else, or else this is gonna happen to you. So those are kinds of, kind of very common ways that, that we, think of, we think of power. The power of God is qualitatively different than any of these kinds of power. Now it's true, we probably experience the power of God in these kinds of ways, but the power of God is, is qualitatively different than these kinds of power. You see, God's ways are not our ways, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's power is not like our power. And we could say a great deal about that and about how that works, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer, because, because God has the power to blow our minds, I'm gonna offer something that's gonna like, whoa, that's just like, gonna kinda of rearrange your brain cells. So when I, I have the power to, to cook something, right? I have, I have natural gas, and I can, I can get some, I can cook pasta, 
I can put some pasta in boiling water, and I can make pasta, and I can make sauce and put, put the sauce on there. And I, so I have the power to do that. And if all of a sudden, that's kind of morbid, if all of a sudden if I were just to collapse and drop dead and cease to exist, I think we would all agree that that pasta and sauce would continue to exist. They wouldn't disappear. They would be there, right? That, that, that's, that's the way that, the, that my power works. But God's power is different. If God were to cease to exist, everything is would cease to exist and would never have been. It's a very different kind of power. That God's being, God's existence, uh, shapes everything that is. None of us has power like that. Right? None of us can, can say that about ourselves. And, and, and what we say that all of us, every single one of us, all of creation is contingent on the existence of God, on the being of God. We are contingent beings. If God didn't exist, we wouldn't exist. Our, our very breath is contingent on God. That's, pow- that's, that's a kind of power, right? That's a qualitatively different kind of power than the kinds of power I was talking about. It is radically different kinds of power because God is radically different than us. And when we think about that, we begin to see that every single moment of our lives, everything around us, the air we breathe, the trees, the rocks, everything, is charged with God's grandeur, and is a gift. And in our tradition, a gift uh, given in love. Every moment of our lives is a gift, and it's the power of God made known around us. The cross, Paul says, is this kind of power. It is the power of God. It is the power of a gift freely given and offered. And the strange thing about the cross is that it doesn't seem to be so, right? The cross is an instrument of capital punishment. The cross is a tool that the Romans used to say, if you don't do what we want you to do, if we don't behave in the way that we want you to behave, we're gonna crucify you. That's, they have that power, that's our power. It is the power of coercive force. It's a coercive kind of power. And the cross was intended to be gruesome and grisly and awful as a public proclamation, a public demonstration of power. If you don't do what we want you to do, this is going to happen to you. And, it's, and, 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 and we'll do it too. But Paul says the cross is not the power of the Roman Empire. It's not the power of coercive force. It is the power of God. And it is the power of love. The earliest proclamations of the church in Acts 2, the first, the first sermons of Peter, Peter repeatedly says, you crucified the author of life, the one in whom all things hold together, the one in, in, whom, in whom we all have our being, upon whose existence we are dependent, our lives are contingent. You've killed, you've killed him, yet it was impossible 
for death to hold him. In the end, you could, not, you could not kill him. Killing him was impossible. And that this act, this act of love poured out for all creation was an act of gift, an act of power. This is strange. This is strange to think about and strange to wrap our minds around it. And we don't, we don't, um, we don't explain it. In a sermon on Sunday morning, it's something that we ponder and compl- contemplate and that we think about over and over again. We're going to sing a, a song uh, about, about the cross and, and how it means so many different things. It's, what, is, what, is, what is the cross and what does it mean f- What does it mean for us? And how do we articulate it? How do we express it? And Christians have struggled over the years to do that. At the end of the day, we say the cross is the power of God. It is the power of gift. It is the power of love, an act of love. And it is not the power of the Roman Empire. It it is, in fact, the opposite of that. It is the Roman Empire that is being mocked and made fun of, not Jesus at the end of the day. A paradox, as the song says. This Lent we've been talking about uh, Jesus' commandment to take up our cross and to follow, to follow Jesus. Now we are not, we are not, um, we, we do not, in this time, possess the power of God in that kind of way. But in calling us to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow, Jesus is inviting us to partake in that kind of power, in the power of the cross. Jesus, uh, Paul says in Romans, in your baptisms, You died with Christ. You became one with Christ. One with God. And you rose out of the waters of baptism to new life. In Christ. And in so doing, we partake in God's power. That's inter- it's interesting. Uh, interesting for me to try to wrap my mind around that. I'm, I mean, I, I I can't really. But I wonder what that. I want. I wonder what it means to take on that kind of power. To take on the power of gift. To take on the power of God. I'm gonna. I, I, I've struggled with how to end this sermon, and I'm gonna leave it hanging. I'm not going to wrap things up neatly because I don't think this wraps up neatly. I think it's a paradox. I think it's something that, that we live with. It's a tension that we live with and wonder about. And when I think about what I want to happen, I want us to wonder. I want us to ponder. I want us to be a little confused about what this means. But I want us to trust that God is good and that God is powerful Maybe not in the ways that we usually think about power. And that we can, in some sense, participate in the power of God. We read the cross so many ways. Number 569.
Now is the time for our tithes and offerings. Please bring them forward to the baskets in the central circle or give online to, Goshen, to collegemennoniteschurch.org. This is also the first Sunday of March, so if you have a birthday during the month of March, during the offering time, please come forward to the circle for the birthday offering and a blessing from a pastor. We will sing our offertory this morning, the song Seeds, which is number 777 in the Purple Voices Together, number 777. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. Make us one with you, one with Christ, and one, one in ministry to all the world. We ask that you receive this offering as a sign of our worship and our praise and our, our adoration. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We are singing Sija Hambanaye. It's Voices Together 815. It's on the screen as well. We're going to be singing in three different languages, so it might be easier to, to just look on the screen.
Several announcements before the benediction. Discipling Commission invites you to stop by their table in the hallway to learn more about the retreat they are offering on March 16 for adult faith formation. Gifts Discernment Committee asks you to stay tuned for an email coming about church board nominations. They encourage you to prayerfully consider who you might nominate. And Community Life Commission invites you to first Wednesdays at CMC this coming Wednesday at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Now receive this benediction. Go now in peace and be of good courage. And may our powerful God, who fills the hungry with good things, fill us all with Christ-like love and with a consuming hunger for justice in our land and in our world. Amen.